is, is true, right? Learning how to learn. We all probably learn in different ways. So learning how you learn and, and knowing how to do research is so important because at the end of the day, you're not going to have the answers. I, I didn't have any of the answers. I don't have any of the answers today, but knowing who to talk to or where to try and get that information is, is probably more important than having the actual answers. Welcome to the Break Free Podcast. I am your host, David Mancella. This podcast has been created to honor the people that are changing this world for a better place. And today we have with us a wonderful example of that type of personality. Jose, welcome to the show. Hi, David. Thanks for having me. I'm really excited to be here with you. You know, Jose, when I came to Canada back in 1991, people started calling me David. And I kind of liked it, so I kept it. Uh, but you know, in, in Spanish, they call me David. And so for you, you still call yourself Jose. Tell me more about that. Yeah, well, that's a great question because my dad's name uh, was Jose too. So it's it's the name I've heard my entire life for me, for my dad. And um, funny you mention it because several times I've been told, well, it might be, might be better for your career if you used a Joe or Joseph and but I don't know there's just something something about I think it goes with uh identity and I just personally I think it's a personal choice right for me just I just feel more like a Jose or I react to it automatically yeah. You know, the blessing for me, I completely agree with you. The blessing for me was that the spelling was exactly the same in English as it is in Spanish. Yeah. So I didn't yeah. really mind. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, I mean, it's, it's, it's funny because I changed the spelling a little bit. I don't, I don't have, you know, um, a tilde, right? And, and, right. and on the E. So, but, but it's still pretty much, I, I feel identified. And to be honest, sometimes I, it doesn't bother me at all if people call me Joe, Joseph. Um, I think it, it always comes out of respect. Uh, so it, it really doesn't bother me at all. That's beautiful. So people may know that uh, you are not a born uh, citizen of the United States. You're an immigrant like I am to Canada. Tell me a little bit more about you. So first, give me your full name. Where do you live? And what do you do for a living? Yeah, absolutely. So my full name, it's funny because I was born and raised in Venezuela. So you, the full name would have two last names. So my, my full name is Jose Junior Di Geronimo D'Ambrosio. So it's, there's a big <laughs> there, right? But, but it's uh, Jose Di Geronimo. Uh, born and raised in Venezuela. Um, I did high school up until high school in Venezuela the same school from elementary school all the way through high school. So I have friends from my entire uh, youth that I, I'm still in touch with and, and moved to the US right after high school. So I was 16, 2003. So it's it's been a journey so far for me, but uh, I, I feel blessed that, that I've been on this journey. Yeah. That's beautiful. When when I when I got the pleasure to meet you and, and do the first screening interview, I just couldn't believe your your career, your life path, how you landed in the states. I cannot wait for you to share your story. So let's start with Venezuela. Back in the '70s, Venezuela was the the Miami of Latin America. People didn't go to Miami; they went to Venezuela. People didn't went to didn't go to the United States to get a job; they went to Venezuela to get a job. What happened there, Jose? Yeah, uh, I think uh, people were too greedy. I think politicians got too greedy, uh, and instead of worrying about the overall wealth of the com of the country and and the people, they worry more about themselves and being in power. And and uh, I mean, I, I was born in the '80s, so the '70s I'm not familiar with, but I I only hear great things about the '70s. And to be fair, I, I had a really great childhood. But I could hear around me everyone saying just things are getting worse and worse, right? Every year, they're not what they used to be. I think for like a dollar was what four four believer is a dollar. So people would travel back and forth between Miami and, and Venezuela every weekend just to go shopping and things like that. 
Um, and then it just started getting worse and worse. And instead of um, trying to create some type of structure for the future of the country, establish a foundation for growth and development, uh, people were thinking more on the short term. And that's kind of what turned things down and ultimately what made a lot of us leave the country, right? It's, it's sad, right? Because um, when I hear that Venezuela has about the same or more oil than Qatar does, and when you look at the income per capita in Qatar, it's $100,000 a year per person. Yeah. I'm like, what's going on? Like, it's, I cannot believe that a government has so much power to destroy or to build a country up. Yeah, right? no, it, it's... It's crazy, in my opinion, because I remember, and I don't know the accurate numbers, but in early 2000s, I think oil was around 100 bucks a barrel, right? And the country was still producing two, three million barrels a day. And and you could see the prosperity, right? Because there was a lot of money coming in, but not necessarily invested in the right things for, for sustainable growth. And I think that was one of the differences between the two countries. Right, Venezuela. Uh, we we have great res natural resources. I think we should we should have been we should have leveraged those resources to set the country for the future. And unfortunately, that didn't happen. So it's it's really sad to see the difference between the two. Uh, it seems that maybe there's some hope and some changes happening. So we'll see we'll see if they turn it around. Hopefully. Yeah, let's keep our hopes up. And you yeah. know, the, the sad part is that the country loses the greatest the greatest talent. And the good part is that countries like the United States and Canada, they get advantage of that and you know, we, you know, they get amazing people. And that's yeah. that's the immigrant story, right? Jose is um, the United States and Canada have been built by immigrants. Yeah. People yeah. that had some kind of operation in their countries and for some reason, for example, for, for the United States it was freedom of religion. Right? Uh, Christians were not allowed to profess their faith in England, and that's why they decided to move. Yeah, and, and uh, that's why it's such a prosperous country now. And it's that diversity of people that come there to build a future. Yeah, have that American dream, and that's why I, you know, having you in this podcast is beautiful because you're a recent example of that. So tell me, you land? When did you land in the United States, and what did you do after that? It was either August 4th, 2003 or August 3rd, 2003. I can't remember exactly. It was one of those two. It was the day after my high school graduation party. Uh, we, we left. So it's, it's, a, it's a whole story why we left the entire family. Uh, my side, my dad, my mom, my, my two brothers and I. And then on my mom's side, she has two sisters and their families. So it was all of us. We left and we moved to Orlando, uh, Orlando, Florida. Things were not safe in Venezuela. Right? And that's that's primarily why we left uh, anywhere in the U.S. If you meet someone from Venezuela, you will probably hear some type of story why they left. And it's usually not, oh, I just because I wanted to. It's more they were forced like many immigrants. Right. I don't think anyone necessarily won wants to leave the country where they were born uh, but they're forced to uh, as soon as we got here um, to be honest uh, I had the support from my family and I think we just you know like many immigrants uh, we didn't know many people we didn't know the system in any way possible right like the healthcare education we didn't just didn't know anything so there was a lot of struggles just trying to figure out the system and then I think it's been part of what I've been through in my career and my time in the U.S. is just trying to figure out how the system works right, and how life works and how relationships work uh, and how to get to that next level through uh, relationships. Right. So I actually attend the community college. That's where that's where I started, so Valencia Community College. And I thought it was the best experience for me. Right. Uh, I, I wanted to go to uh, Embry-Riddle to get a degree in, aeros in aerospace, but I ended up going to community college and then University of Florida because I thought you had to pay cash for your school. So it was right. And it, unlike 
in Venezuela, that's how you do it, right? You go, you have to, you have to pay in cash the the school year. Uh, so that was that was my first learning lesson: is no, you don't have to, you don't have to do that. There are student loans and scholarships and and things like that that you can leverage. But it was a great experience for me, uh, Valencia Community College and uh, and University of Florida. It's it, they basically that's where I had the foundation to 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 grow. And I think I got all the the learnings and education I could have gotten anywhere else. Uh, so I'm a mechanical engineer, as you know. Uh, so I'm a nerd. I love being a nerd. Uh, I when people get to know me, they can see I'm an introvert, but uh, I'm, I'm, t- I'm technically a nerd, and I and I enjoy it fully. I mean, that's that's why that's why I'm here at Amalga, right? It's a very technical company, and uh, from there. I moved to Philadelphia. That's where I started my career, my full-time career. I, I started at Boeing, and it, it, what a wonderful experience for me to work at Boeing. Amazing products, uh, very smart people to work with, very fun environment. Being hands-on, working on helicopters and, and airplanes, it was just fascinating. You know, so right after home. right after college, you landed a, a job in a Fortune 100 company. It was it was. That's amazing. It's one of those things that, you know, it's, and I, yeah, it was fantastic. I mean, I was very fortunate with the opportunities that I've had and, and, and I'll put it out there. It's, it, there's a ship conference, right? Society of Hispanic Professional Engineers, right? And it was through that network that I was able to learn how to interview, how to present myself, how to write a resume, right? Who to talk to. And that's, that's technically how I got my foot in the door uh, with three great companies that I did internships with, General Electric, Boeing, and, and Siemens, right? And ultimately full-time, I ended up going with Boeing. Yeah, it was it was fascinating. You know, you mentioned a great point, internship. Uh, so your, your, your career had the chance to actually do a semester or, you know, a few months in a different company as you were going through university. Yeah. I think that's the best thing in the world. You know, we have a program here in Waterloo. Uh, so I, I, I live in, in, in Canada, about 100 miles away from Toronto. And where I live, we have the three best universities, one of the three best universities in the, in the country. One of them is University of Waterloo, and they have a co-op program. Actually, the three, so Conestoga College, Wilfrid Laurier University, and University of Waterloo, all of them have this internship program. And, it's incredible because when you are when you leave, you have some kind of experience, and that helps so much. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, I and I think, of course, when you're in school, you maybe just you want to graduate and go get a job right as soon as possible. I want to get out of school. But uh, if you look at a, an engineer, right, there are so many paths that you can take as an engineer. If you think as a mechanical engineer, right, there are so many things that you could do from purely design to process to hands on engineering. And I I don't think I think you doing internships helps you really realize what career path you want to take. Right. And the other thing is what industry you want to be in, what type of culture, company culture you want to be part of, be part of a big company, small company. So I, I always encourage people to do internships, a few ones to at least get a sense of what they really enjoy doing. Yeah. It's beautiful. Uh, so you go for Boeing. Did, did it happen to you what happened for me? When I got my first job as a software engineer, I thought I knew everything. And then when, once I sit on that desk, everything that I needed to do, I had no idea how to. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. <laughs> yes, I, I I knew nothing. I, I knew I knew to ask questions because I knew. <laughs> it's, wow. Okay, so you're doing engineering in your head. Okay, I thought I thought we had to create all. <laughs> so it was it was fascinating to see, going from. I think it's more learning how to think a structured way of thinking that then you need to apply when you're working because yes as soon as as i got i got the job i was like i don't know what i'm doing I, I, <laughs> right so i i need to learn how to 
to navigate and work with other people because otherwise I'm lost. <laughs> it's true, you know, for me, I thought, you know, I, I came out, so I was, I started writing code when I was 16 years old as a hobby. And, you know, I went to computer science school. I graduated once in Guatemala, then twice in Canada. I, 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 I built my own tiny business right after college for two years, failed miserably. So I thought I knew, and then I go to my first corporate job and all the languages they had, I'd never seen in my life before. And the processes were weird. And, you know, they put me a mentor. Thank God this guy was like 45 years old, super experienced. And I learned everything from him. Yeah. But the one thing that I knew is how to do research and have the work ethic that the university taught me. And th those two things, you know, learn how to think and how to learn <laughs> and, yeah. and be a, and apply with discipline. That's yeah. all, right? Yeah, no, and, and that's fascinating because I mean, <laughs> I I'm not gonna lie. My my most challenging class in school was C plus plus, and I I only I only have the highest admiration for <laughs> people who can program because it's gonna be to me the most complicated thing to do, and and once you learn one, the ability that they can write in five six different ones, and that they can they can pick up a new one. Uh, but I think what you're saying is, is true, right? Learning how to learn, we all probably learn in different ways. So learning how you learn and and knowing how to do research is so important because at the end of the day, you're not gonna have the answers. I, I didn't have any of the answers. I don't have any of the answers today, but knowing who to talk to or where to try and get that information is is probably more important than having the actual answers you know for my businesses uh, so I, I have the blessing to run multiple businesses but you know uh, when i started changing my my job interviews for the people that hr was hiring i told them i don't want any like exams while somebody else is watching i want a research paper done and a very complicated one and we give them a week just go figure it out and because that's the best way because you know when they come to the job i don't want them to work isolated i want them to ask questions and to collaborate with other people and if they don't know i need to know that they can go on the internet and figure it out and figure right? it out yeah i mean especially <laughs> all the tools available today right it's 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 so easy to find information right and you know with chat gpt and things like that it's you you can al find almost anything you want Right. Yeah. But knowing where to go to get that information is more important. Problem solving in general, I think yeah. it's more important than than having the answers. What did you do after Boeing, after you became a real engineer? <laughs> yeah. Uh, so Bobby, I was, you know, my dad, my dad had his own business uh, in Venezuela. So he started in real estate and then he had his own company in real estate. And and I, I always find it I always found it fascinating that he had his own company and he he had to go through all these challenges and I also I'm not gonna lie sometimes I'd like to be held accountable for the ultimate decisions that need to be made right and so the small business environment kind of started going in my head but after Boeing I actually got my MBA I, I moved to Chicago I got an MBA and that that was another you know, moment of my life here in the U.S. that kind of my eyes were wide open to many other opportunities. Up until that time, I knew engineering. I knew, uh, you know, all the what you imagine the blue blue chip uh, companies, right? The GEs, the Boeing, the Chevron, and then I go to business school, and it's this whole world of investments and consulting, and then you know, banking, private equity, tech, and it was fascinating. So I actually did the two year full time program and I try to do as much as possible. So I, I, I did co-ops. I did every single lab that you can imagine just to learn about, OK, what's the next thing that I want to do? Because I thought I wanted to go back to Boeing. But this this thing in the back of my head of wanting to have my own business kind of intensified a little bit more and more. And and I didn't I didn't jump into doing that right after school because I was afraid, right? I didn't I didn't have a lot of mentors at the time. I didn't know who to ask, how to 
do it. So I, I went with a safe choice and I did consulting uh, at Accenture and it was a, it was a wonderful job. I mean, it's, it's another, you know, different skills that you learn, but having to learn how to think on your feet and deliver presentations and it was fascinating, right? And everyone that you work with is, you know, super smart. They, they're all incredibly smart. General consulting is the is the most beautiful bridge between a full time job and a business and a business owner. I did the same path, and actually I was guided through that because you know when I started my first business right after college in Canada, I failed. I didn't go bankrupt because I was able to sell it for the amount of money that I owed, uh, which was a mirror. But I already had enough reputation. That's why they bought it from me. But I was so afraid, just like you, I was so afraid to go back and try again that, you know, one of my mentors, uh, he was a consultant. I was working for a blue chip company too in Canada, telecom big, the biggest telecommunications company in the, in the, in the country. And, and so they will hire independent consultants to do the work. And this guy, he was like 20 years older than me. And he, he says, you know, David, you know, don't swear it, man. You just, just become a consultant. I'm like, what's that? You know, like, <laughs> I never heard about that. So he said, well, well, you're your own boss. And, you know, and, and so he's, he laid it out for me. And uh, and I'm like, OK, I'm going to try this. But it still took me three more years. Like, I, I didn't have the enough courage to try it, you know? Yeah, because uh, it's, a, it's a big leap, right? For me, it was consulting at a big company, the structure. For you, you had, you, you basically, your consulting is your first, like a company, right? It's your company. It's your consulting yeah. company. So, <laughs> and and that step is, it's a big step because now you're in charge of everything. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> from sales, from marketing, from actually doing the consulting job. So you're in charge of everything and you have to learn how to prioritize. So it is a big leap going from a structure environment where they have processes and and you know a reputation and they have all the tools you can imagine uh, to now you have to make it happen right it's, it's but you know jose it's also for me like when i advise young people on getting their own job i told them go to corporate go learn that because you learn that right right yeah i i did too because these guys were there they were all consultants and they were all reporting some of them were reporting to me and so the business acumen i got it from corporate so when i opened my own business the first thing that I called it was ISU Corp for corporation. And I modeled it after a blue chip company. And I didn't need to do that because I was a tiny puny business, but I had the structure to grow and that's what made me grow. Yeah, I mean, I think it's it's part of, you know, if, if to like you go into corporate, you know, you're gonna learn things that you're not gonna have to learn on your own if you go straight up into having your own business. Don't get me wrong. I also think I don't have, I'm not, I'm not a startup person. I, I, I do think that's a even more difficult level of how to start your own business, but going to corporate, it gave me at least, you know, what a structure of a company should look like. What, what, you know, even as simple as how to use Microsoft office, right? How to schedule meetings, right? Foundational things that otherwise I would have had to learn on my own. And, and when you're on your own, if you're spending time learning that, you're not spending time bringing the dollars. <laughs> 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 yeah, you, you only have so many hours in the day, you know? <laughs> so it's, so yeah, better to learn how to use Microsoft Office when you're in a corporate job and, and <laughs> yeah. learn, know how to use the tools to help you grow your business for sure. Yeah. So, was it, how long did you last in that, that, that consulting gig? That, that was a couple of years. It was almost like a typical two year, but I think it was more. Uh, that's when I was like, okay, I have to, I have to try this, having my own business uh, career path, right? And and I met a, an incredible group, Search Fund Accelerator, Tim Bovard. He, it's basically they they backed me up to find a business, right? And and. That, that again, it was a complete change in my career path, right? I was I was hired to find a business that uh, I thought had a potential for growth and that I wanted to go run, right? And for about a year and a half, I was looking for a business all over the US. So it was 
So this is the first time I hear that, and I've been in business in Canada for you know, wow, for a long time, and I am involved with startups because I, I write software for startups too and, and multinationals too. Uh, tell me that model. How did that? How do you come about learning that this model existed where you will get hired by a hedge fund or by an investment fund to find a company to grow? Yeah, I, it's. <laughs> I just, it happens to be, I'm one day at, at the University of Chicago in one of my classes or at school, just looking what class to take next. And and there it is, right? Entrepreneurship through acquisition. And I'm like, well, that sounds interesting. So there's this space within the private equity model. And it's been around, I think, since the 80s. But in the 80s, it was one person doing search, what they call search. And that's when it technically started. But it's, it's, it's a small, really small market within private equity. And it's it's basically people who have some sort of work experience and uh, have the, you know, a business acumen, or allegedly we have business acumen and, and want to have their own business, but don't necessarily have, you know, the backing or, um, for me, it was not just the backing, but also kind of a structure of mentors, having like your own board of people guiding you, looking at good businesses, not good businesses. So that's that's where I first heard of it. But I mean, for me, it was like, this is this cannot be that simple that someone is just gonna pay you to search to then pay you to run a business that you bought. Right? So it was like, there's got to be some catch here. So for a couple of years, I was like, no, you probably need to have private equity background. And mm -hmm. and that's not true. They, in uh, Especially at SFA, they, they want people who truly want to run a business because really the kind of the, the thought process behind being an investor and being a operator could be a little bit different, right? So if you want to get your hands dirty and but want to run your own business, the entrepreneurship through acquisition, the search fund path, it's really, it's really the way to go. And it is a small niche of a small group of companies or investors out there, but they are very welcoming. They, I mean, I had probably 200 phone calls between investors, uh, searchers or CEOs or people who succeeded or failed to understand kind of that ecosystem. And it's, it's been fascinating. It's something that I've told everyone around me. If you, if you ever had the dream to run a business, this is a great way for, for you to try. Mm. Yeah. It's fascinating. You know, I, you know, I don't believe in coincidences. I believe in faith. I'm a man. I'm a man of faith, I'm a born again Christian. And when you told me the story and where you come from and how different the countries are and how by getting an MBA, what tiny class that you took that talked about this, defined your future in a way that most people don't even dream about because now you, you're running a multi-million dollar company that you are making it grow, that you found, that you did, but somebody paid you to find like, it seems too good to be true, right? It, 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 to me, it is, right? And and I don't know, maybe call it naive, I, I don't know, but people people sometimes they ask me like, uh, well, are, are you afraid, right? And I'm like, I don't know. Like, what is the worst thing that could happen? You know, the, in, my, in my mind, I've been fortunate enough to get all these opportunities and the worst thing that can happen is find another job that I know I hopefully I'll be able to find because of all these other experiences that I've had. So it is, it is incredible to me how, you know, I moved to the US. I don't know that you can get a, um, a student loan or scholarships to go to a private school to do aerospace, but it was because I went to community college that I was able to connect to the school system in Florida that then got me into the Society of Hispanics, right? That then that's in one of those conferences is when I met one person at Boeing that kind of we clicked, right? And it was that person at Boeing that introduced me. And it's like everything is really connected in a way when you look back and, and you see how it, it seems that it's random, but I really don't think it is random at all. You know, uh, 
you know, I, I, I went away from my faith from my faith for about 20 years just because I fell in love with money. And then I had to learn a hard lesson, almost losing my wife, my kids, my businesses, even my life. But when the Lord rescued me, I, I started reading the Bible. And uh, I'm mentioning this because what you just said, when you look back and you see the dots, so it turns out that in Psalm 139, it says that the Lord thought about you before the creation of the earth. And he wrote a book about your life with every single page defining what you're going to do before you were born. Now, that book is not, is not written in stone because we, are, we have free will. We can go astray and, and do horrible things if we wish to. But in your case, in my case, you know, I was astray, but you know, I was one of, one of those rescue missions that the Lord had to do to guide me, guide me back onto my path. And when I look back, even the things that I did wrong, I realized that helped me to be where I am right now. Yeah. <laughs> <It's> like... <laughs> no, absolutely. Every every experience, every person that I've met, and, and that's one thing that uh, I do think it's worth mentioning is it's I've been very fortunate to have a structure around me of people that have supported me, people who have, you know, cheered to help me, you know, continue to be excited about trying something new. Right. Uh, my family and friends, I have incredible family and friends that have always been there. And I'm not going to lie, I do think it would have been more challenging, way more challenging without having that structure uh, around me, that support structure. Yeah. But that's what I mean, though, right? Like, why do you have that core structure and somebody else don't? Right? Yeah. Somebody else doesn't. I know. Yeah. It. And sometimes right. it feels like a, a, uh, like a little bit of guilt sometimes, you know? And, and, <laughs> It's not yeah. guilt. No, you have to have gratitude. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I am. No, I am blessed. I am blessed, <laughs> and and that's why. So a lot of people tell me you 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 smile all the time. And I was like, because you know I have there are challenges in my day today in my life, but overall it's I've been very blessed with everything that I've uh, received throughout my life. You know. You know, I'm gonna tell you a story that proves my point. When I was in corporate. One of my last jobs, I worked three years for this multi, uh, multi uh, province. We have provinces in Canada, we don't have states. So it was a coast to coast laboratory. So they had like many laboratories across the country with multiple disciplines. They did lab testing for multiple things like DNA testing, food testing, water testing, and stuff like that, environment testing. And I did great in that job. I, you know, it was one of the first senior roles that I took as a, you know, as a software leader. Uh, leader in technology, and we did great things there. Okay, that, that went away. Then I had another job. Then I opened my business. Eleven years went away. Like went went by. Eleven years went by. I completely disconnected from that life. Started writing multiple applications for finance and you know different things. Uh, nothing related to laboratory management. The one year that I thought I was going to collapse. This is 2013 because we were, or my costs were bigger than my my income, and no matter what I did, I couldn't get more clients. And my faith was strong, like something's gonna happen. At the for the Christmas season, two things happened. One thing, I didn't have enough money for payroll, like I ran out. I didn't have anything else to do. And usually Christmas, we give our salaries two weeks before so people can spend their money. And uh, it was December the 12th, my business manager told me, David, we, we, where, how are we going to make payroll? But I had my faith was so strong. And I'm like, I don't know, but a miracle is going to happen. It has to happen. Because, you know, there's, you know, there's a lot of people waiting for their salary. Yeah. The first time that happens in my business life, and it's been, you know, I started the business in 2005, so it was a, always already a mature business. And then that was a Friday on Monday, she comes back to my office. She, she knocks on my door, she's crying. And she says, look, and I got two government checks, not only to not only to cover payroll that month, but to cover payroll the next month. And I'm like, where is this money coming from? It turns out that the Canadian government has a program called SRND, 
a research and development program that you can apply if you're pushing technology to better the country's environment. They will give you a grant of, they will pay your expenses for the software or whatever it is that you build. I applied for that grant for 2010 and 2011, but because it's government, I never looked back because I thought, oh, I'm not going to get it approved. They approved it in 2013 and they sent me the two checks in the same day, the day that I needed to do payroll. Wow. But this is not the end of the story. Remember the lab, the lab thing? Yeah. Right? yeah. I still had the problem that I didn't have enough business. Right. January comes in. I rarely looked at LinkedIn back then, but I had this thing to try to look. Yeah, I just like, I'm just going to check LinkedIn. January, January like 10th. And uh, I get this message in LinkedIn. It's like, David, is this David Mancilla? I've been looking all over the, the Canada for you. Like, where are you? His name was Andrew Masters. He was he was my internal client when I was working for this laboratory. So basically, he was the VP of lab science, and he was in charge of all the lab processes in this big company. And he said, I changed jobs. I'm working for a new lab. These guys are completely obsolete. They are going very bad because they cannot grow because the system sucks and I know you can build a system for me to make the long story short that client is still with me they are still my best clients he not only his his input to my business not only made me break even but he's, he's he was responsible for bringing profitability back in the business and that opened the world to, to lab science in a way that it's a miracle. It is. It is. A miracle. I never had to look back. It is, it is a miracle, right? And, and there, there is that saying in Spanish, Dios aprieta, pero no ahorca. I don't know if you've heard that one, right? God is going to squeeze you a little bit, but it's not going to choke you <laughs> completely. Wow. And it's just fascinating to hear that story. Yeah. Wow. wow. So, you know, thank you so much for sharing your story, Jose. Um, I know you're running this incredible business. I know the responsibility is huge. Uh, tell me, do they give you equity when you when you land the business and they buy it for you? Yeah, so that's that's part of the process, and it's a very standard process. Anyone can go out there, and and kind of the structure is the same for everyone who who gets into this space. Uh, you get equity when you buy the business. The moment you buy it, you kind of vest on that part of the equity. Then, after four years, five years, running the business. And then, of course, meeting some financial criteria, you'll get that third tranche. So it's kind of a three way to earn equity in the business. But the most one of the most fascinating things for me has been the flexibility, really the partnership that I have with the group that I'm in, because uh, for some reason they trust me 100 uh, percent. And even though, of course, you know, I keep them up to date and we talk every day, we're almost friends now they they trust my decisions and my gut feelings as much as possible right and and i have that support so having not only not, not not only being able to run the business but being able to run the business how i think the business should run after of course talking with the board directors and things like that getting feedback it's just a, an incredible experience that i, I just don't know where else I could have gotten that experience. It's beautiful. Yeah. Jose, you know, more than 40 minutes have come by already and we could be talking all day, but I want to really respect your time. <laughs> I know that this podcast is going to open the eyes to a lot of people that are looking for, for being entrepreneurs. I know your responsibility is great because now you have to perform so that these people get their money back and you also grow. Yeah. But you know, that's with everything, right? Absolutely. You know, when you were in a job, when you were consulting, you had a huge responsibility too, right? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. One of the one of the one of the best things about this job, though, is is uh, knowing that this company uh, is giving checks to people who want to be here and help their families through jobs, right? It's probably the, one of the most rewarding things that I've probably done. Absolutely. And and I mean, I appreciate the time. This has been fascinating and, and I've enjoyed it tremendously. And the only thing I can hope is or wish is that if anyone out there, uh, I can be of any help, 
right? Like I said, I, I moved when I was 16. I moved to the U.S. when I was 16, and I've been through all these processes trying to figure out on my own. I wouldn't say that I've made it, but in, inside of me, I, I kind of feel like I'm able to do whatever I set my mind to. Uh, and and if there's anything anything that I can do, someone to coach them, mentor them, or, or guide them in any way. It's, it's really, I think it's also about giving back and, and helping other people achieve their dreams. Thank you so much, Jose. I uh, really appreciate this podcast. It's the beginning of that mentorship. A lot of people will get blessed with this, with this interview. Uh, one last question before we finish. If you had access to a billboard in front of the busiest highway on earth, what would you write in? Uh, take the risk, take that leap. Take the risk. Yep. take that step of faith yep. <laughs> yeah Jose, thank you so much thank if you people so much. like to ask you more questions are you on linkedin how can they find you yes you can find me on linkedin jose de geronimo uh you can find me on twitter jose de geronimo if you look up jose de geronimo and you follow it by amalga composites i'm i'm trying to be as much as possible out there so that i'm easy to be contacted uh you can also email me First name, last name, Jose de Geronimo at gmail.com. Whatever way to contact me, uh, feel free to do so. Thank you so much, Jose. And one last thing, uh, the, the investment company that you joined looks like an, an exceptional company. And uh, I tell that with respect because I know a lot of them and some of them are, you know, are not so, uh, not so social, to put it that way. Yeah. Um, do you mind sharing their information so people, if people want to find out what they do? Absolutely. So if you go to searchfundaccelerator.com, so it's the company is called Search Fund Accelerator, SFA, uh, Tim Bover, magnific magnificent person. He will have your back and your support 100%. He, he had his own business and he just want to let, want, wants other people to, to do the same thing. Uh, if, if you want to learn more about SFA, about finding a business, buying a business, uh, I'm also happy to talk about that, and, and but SFA wonderful partnership with them, and highly encourage anyone to to work with them. Wonderful, Jose. Thank you so much for your time. God bless thank you, man, you. and have a beautiful rest of the week. <laughs> thank you too. Take care. That's all for today's episode of the Break Free Podcast. Head on over to iTunes and subscribe to the show. Starting your own business can be tough, but it doesn't have to be. Visit davidmansilla.com to pick up a copy of the number one international best-selling book, Breaking Out of Corporate Jail. Expand what you consider to be possible and reach your full potential. And join us on the next episode.